John 3, 1 to 15. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying. You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things. I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still you, do not under, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert... So the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. This is God's word. Now, we've been looking through the Gospel of John at the great images or pictures that Jesus uses to engage the mind. It's, it's so good, he not only engages the mind, but the, your heart, because he doesn't, he doesn't just use technical terms, he uses pictures, illustrations. They're filled with both... They're filled with so much information. And he talks about, so in other words, Jesus doesn't talk about your epistemological inadequacy. He says, I am the light of the world. Don't walk in darkness. Isn't that better? Uh, and he said, I'm the light. I am the vine. I am the bread. We talked last week. We saw he, is the live, he brings the living water. Now, tonight we come to the one metaphor, the one image, through which he describes who he is and what we uh, should be to him and what he is to us. And all these metaphors, he comes tonight to the one that's the most famous and also, let's face it, the most problematic for us to understand because it has its own freight today. It has its own meaning in contemporary culture. He says, you must be born again. Well, and as you see, if, uh, if I tell my contemporary American neighbor, uh, I go to the Church of the Living Water, They'll say, oh, that, mm, yeah, that's nice. But if you say to your neighbor, I go to the church of the born again, or if, I, if you say, I'm a born again Christian, they go, hmm. Because you, see, because you see, in our contemporary culture, born again has a meaning, and it's not the meaning that Jesus Christ gives it here. And that's why in order to come to grips with what Jesus is saying here, we have to come to grips with, with the misunderstandings we have today. Therefore, it's very important to be clear, and I'm, I'm going to try to be tonight, to look at this passage and say, what does Jesus teach about the new birth? Not what you've heard, not what you think, not what uh, experts say. What does Jesus say about the new birth? And let's ask three questions. I mean, uh, you know, how important is it? What is it? And how do we receive it? Hmm? How important is it? What is it? How do we receive it? Now, first, what does Jesus say? What does Jesus say? about uh, how important it is. And he says in verse 7, you must. Now, fortunately for us, Nicodemus, the man that Jesus Christ gives this call to, of the new birth, is almost exactly the kind of person that contradicts the very misconceptions that people have today about the new birth. He's exactly the kind of person we don't think of as needing to be born again. Now, what do I mean? All right, let's, let's do this. I said uh, today, I mean, pollsters, people are always taking polls now, and pollsters will tell you that 70, 80% of Americans would rather not have a born-again Christian as a neighbor. Why? Well, here's because of what they, here's what they think. 
If you ask a person, and again, the, the polls will tell you this too, if you ask somebody, the average person today, what is the born again experience, what does it mean to be born again? What's a born again Christian? They'll give you one of two answers or both. I mean, they, they may hold both of them. At the very best, they say, born again is a deep, cathartic, emotional experience. And it's especially for people who need that, broken people like convicts or drug addicts, or people whose temperament or culture uh, you know, comports with that kind of emotional expression. So it's a deep, cathartic emotional experience. And or, they'll say, being born again means to adopt a very tight, traditional, authoritarian moral structure. It's for people, uh, you know, some would say just as born again is a deep experience for people who need that kind of emotional catharsis. Also, it seems to be this, uh, to be born again people are people who take upon themselves tight moral structure. People that seem to need Every, uh, they need, everything needs to be black and white for them. They need answers for everything. Uh, people who, who really need that kind of moral security. So it's either a moral, uh, uh, emotional experience or the adoption of moral uh, structures. But what, G see, Jesus gives the call to the new birth to this man, Nicodemus. When we look and see who he is, we realize that completely contradicts what contemporary people think the, the new birth or the born again experience is or what it's for. Look, first of all, Nicodemus is completely the opposite of a broken or emotionally expressive person. Who is he? Well, it says he was, look at verse 1, he's a member of the Jewish ruling council. Now, right away, the Sanhedrin, and right away we know several things about him. First of all, it means he's old. You didn't get up there unless you were an older man. Secondly, he was a man, of course. Thirdly, he was rich. Fourthly, he was, a, he was learned. You see, they were teachers. Notice down here in verse 10, you are Israel's teacher. That's actually a technical term. You, are, uh, you, you have a PhD from an Ivy League school. You are a scripture scholar. You, you, uh, you, know, you are the, one of the accredited establishment. You are the cultural elite. And so basically, what he's, what, you know, this is who he is. But not only that, let's notice some, something else about him. Not only is he all these things, but he is not spiritually seeking. It's very important to see. Somebody says, well, why did he go? Well, most of the commentators will tell you. Notice, for example, he goes at night. Hmm? He came to Jesus at night. It's also probably, this is kind of dramatic, it's probably also a dark and stormy night because Jesus, uh, it, down in verse 7, he refers to the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound. Now, the Greek word there is voice. And it's fairly, fairly uh, probable that Jesus is talking about the, the, the voice, the sound of the wind that they were listening to right now. So in other words, Nicodemus comes on a dark and stormy night. Why? Well, you know what? The key to understanding probably why he's got coming is his introductory words, and especially what? He does not say, look, Rabbi, I know you're a teacher. What does he say? We know. What's intriguing about this is here you have a man who is representing a group of people and he's in the establishment, and most of the establishment is against Jesus. But here's what he's doing. He's doing backroom politicking. He's coming at night, doesn't want people to see, but he says this. He says, he says now, young man, uh, you know, most of the establishment is against you, but there's some of us that want to play ball with you. Some of us see that you are a tremendous teacher. Some of us see you, your miracles are genuine. You're a man to be reckoned with, and we would like to play ball with you. This is the voice of the establishment saying, hey, hey, you know what? We'd like to get you involved. We think you could help us, and we could help you. Now, this means this man is not spiritually seeking. This is not a man who is, is all pent up. He's got problems in his life. He's saying, I need to find meaning in life. No. He's just come to do backroom politicking. And he's not, he's not an emotional type. He's a dead white male. I mean, he's an older man. He's, a, he's, a, he's the intellectual types. You know, he's reached the t He's content. He's cognitive. He's a man. You know, you know he doesn't go into all this emotional stuff. And Jesus looks at him and says, you must be born again. You, not seeking, not emotionally broken, not a drug addict, not a person at the bottom, a person at the top, you have to be born again. You know, one of the ironic, ironic things is in the last four or five years, um, if you read journals on, boy, almost on anything, frankly, if you, if you just read uh, magazines and journals, you'll know that there's a growing consensus that the problems of the inner city uh, if they're really going to be addressed, they'll have to be addressed by churches and ministries and faith-based uh, institutions 
and programs. There is, when I say a, a growing consensus across the spectrum, Democrats, Republicans, all across the spectrum, there's more and more people saying, hey, we happen to look at these things and we know empirically that, that uh, prison, prisoner rehabilitation programs that are faith-based, drug rehabilitation programs that are faith-based, just simply do better. They're, they're more effective than secular programs. And so more and more people are writing from these great think tanks and in these great journals and even in the op-ed pages of the great papers. And they say, yes, you know what? We've had to come to reconcile the fact that for these people, these broken people, it looks like this born-again stuff works. Yes, for them, for those people. It, we, we should stop scorning it. It looks like it works for those people. And here, you see, this is the reason why. Jesus does not come to Nicodemus and say, I've got living water, and to the Samaritan woman and say, you must be born again. It's almost like Jesus was thinking of us. Because Jesus Christ, in the most great table turning, comes to the man who writes the op-ed pages, pieces, the man who's got in the think tank, the person with the PhD, the person with the ivy-covered walls on his, uh, of his office. In other words, the, person, the, the cognitive person, the content person, he comes to the person who says, these people down here need this born-again experience, and says, you do too. That's what he's saying. So not only is Nicodemus not, he's the opposite of a broken or emotionally volatile person, but on the other hand, on the other hand, he is not at all a person who needs more moral structure. <laughs> He's a Pharisee. Now, you know anything about Pharisees? I mean, Pharisees had hundreds of rules they had to follow. They, there was a right and wrong way to do everything, even eating your peas, you know, or something like that. And you see, it's typical to say, ah, yes, the born-again experience, that's, for, that's when people take upon themselves moral structure. They clean up their lives. They, they, they really start to uh, become traditional in their, in their values. Traditional values, born again. Here's a man who's as traditional as you could possibly be, who's as structured as you possibly be, could be. You couldn't possibly structure this man's life anymore. And Jesus comes to him and says, you must be born again. Now, you know what that's saying? Jesus Christ's call to the new birth is not a call to morality and religion. It's a challenge to morality and religion. I mean, ju just the other day, I heard somebody say, okay, I overheard, somebody say, she doesn't smoke, I'm, I'm quoting, she doesn't drink and she doesn't sleep around. She's a born-again Christian. And everybody went, oh. <laughs> now, what is that? To be born again means don't smoke, don't drink, don't sleep around. And God and Jesus Christ chooses one person who doesn't smoke, doesn't sleep, doesn't sleep, doesn't, doesn't sleep around, who is absolutely impeccable, and says, you've got to be born again. What do you think he's saying? The message of the new birth is not a call to more morality and moral structure. It's a challenge to it. He's coming to him and saying, and I'm going to show you one second. He's coming to the most impeccably moral person and saying, you have to be born again. You have to start at ground zero. You have to start at day one. Everything you have done counts nothing. There has never been a message that is more radically against morality and religion than the message of the new birth. How dare we say that that's what it is? It's to get, suddenly take on moral structure. In short, Jesus says everybody must be born again. You must be born again. Who you? You all. All of you. It doesn't matter your culture. It doesn't matter your emotional temperament. It doesn't matter your record. It doesn't matter. You must be born again. And he's going, listen, you know what he's doing? Please, do you recognize what he's doing? He's taking away your excuse. He's taking away your self-defense mechanism, the defense mechanism that you use to not consider this for yourself. You see, when you say, ah, oh, it's for emotional people, it's for people who need pat answers, it's for people that need moral structure, what you're doing in such patronizing terms is what you're really saying is, I don't have to think about it for me. I don't need that. He says, yes, you do. When you think of it as an option, when you think of it as for a type of person, or for a type of Christian, or for it, when you think of this as not middle, it, when, you don't, when you think of this as not down the middle Christianity, but kind of fringe Christianity, Christianity for certain kinds of people, for certain kinds of denominations, when you do that, you show you don't understand biblical faith at all. Jesus actually takes him to task. He says in verse 7, you shouldn't be surprised at this. He says, you're going to have to go back and rethink all of faith and spirituality. If, you, if this isn't at the very center of your understanding, then you, have to, you don't understand anything at all about the Bible or about faith or about spirituality. And he's saying the same thing to you. Haven't you used 
This idea that is for certain kinds of people as a way of keeping yourself from having to really think about it for yourself. Stop it. His first point is, we all must be born again. It is that important. It's crucial. It's critical. It's central. That's the first thing. Now, what else does he teach? He teaches us how important it is. We all have to have it. But then secondly, he teaches us a lot in here as to what it is. And this isn't easy. And actually, I must tell you, it's a... You know, once you get rid of the idea that it's a deep emotional experience, I mean, emotion is very often attached to it. But as you can see, the woman at the well had an immediate, major emotional experience. And Nicodemus, and, as we'll, and I'll, in a minute or two I'll trace out his... I mean, Nicodemus, you never get a rise out of Nicodemus. His life has changed, we'll show you. But you never get a rise out of it. See, once you get rid of the idea that it's got to be this incredible emotional thing, and once you, get in, once you get rid of the idea that it's this incredible moral structure, what is it? Ah, see. And it's something everybody's got to have. But now the easy answers, the, the, the cliches, the stereotypical answers are gone. So what the heck is it? Well, the metaphor new birth, it's not the only metaphor Jesus uses. Living water is another metaphor for eternal life, you know. Light is a metaphor for eternal life. So it's not, this isn't the only one. But the reason Jesus uses it is it's a radical metaphor. You have to be born again. Now, here's what I mean. First of all, the new birth is a, is a message, it's, it's morally radical. Now, we already mentioned this, but I better say it, Give, take a minute or two. This is incredibly morally radical, why? Jesus is coming to a very good person, an incredibly moral person, and saying, not, you, you've done very well, Nicodemus, you've come this far, now I will bring you the rest of the way. No, he says, you've got to go back to the beginning. You've got to start at day one. When he says you must be born again, what he's really saying is, nothing you've done counts toward being a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> to be, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven means not a thing you've done counts. You're no further ahead than anybody else. And that's pretty scary. It's a fascinating thing, but you see, th- th- there, is n- there is no more radical statement on morality and goodness than the doctrine of the new birth, than the teaching of the new birth. He's saying, no matter what you've done, it counts for nothing. Everybody's, everybody's got to start over. Every, Christianity is not an addition to what you've done. It's a whole new thing. And, uh, by the way, now, this is one of the reasons why the new birth message, this is the reason why the new birth message has always appealed, always moved, mostly people who are moral and social outsiders, people who are in failure. You know, whenever, whenever Christianity has become the cathedral religion of the insiders of a particular culture, in order for it to get there, it's always got to be twisted beyond recognition. Let me, let me explain what I mean. Since Giuliani started cracking down, I don't have this experience anymore, but over the years, once a month, I speak at the Harvard Club early in the morning. And so usually, most of the most big part of the year, I'm, I'm you know, going in the dark. I get out of the subway uh, in Times Square, and I walk over to the Harvard Club you know, at 44th Street between uh, uh, 5th and 6th. And what, you do in, in the pro- what I would do in the process is over in Times Square, I would pass uh, streetwalkers, prostitutes, and homeless people, the losers of society. And then, you know, and then talk about social nosebleed here. Suddenly, within just feet of that, I'm going into the Harvard Club. You know, panels, uh, everything is paneled, high back chairs made out of real leather, real leather. Uh, the, uh, not like my chairs. I, the, uh, you know, fireplaces, huge fireplaces on every wall, just about in every room. And it reeks of privilege because in there are the winners. Now, if you remember the Harvard Club, I'm not, I'm not you know, saying there's something wrong with that unless you use it like this. Jesus Christ is actually is saying this. He's saying, winners in the Harvard Club, losers in the Times Square Street Club. You are in the same place spiritually. The very same place. If you want to know God through Jesus Christ, you must be born again. That means you've got to start day one. You've all got to start at the same place. Everybody. Now, who's going to receive that message with joy and tears? Not the people in the Harvard Club. And that's the reason why. That, that, that's the reason why. See? That's the reason why when Jesus says, and this is a quote, when he says to the religious leader, when he says to people like Nicodemus, the pimps and the prostitutes get into the kingdom of heaven before you. He is not saying because they're better people. He's saying because they get the gospel. They get the message of the new birth. They're not all, what are you talking about? So it's morally radical, okay? 
By the way, if there's anybody here tonight who says in your heart, if you knew what I'd done, if you knew the things that I've done, if you knew what was on my record, be of good cheer. You're not behind. <laughs> You're not behind the most wonderful and accomplished person in the world. When it comes to God, we must be born again. So it's morally radical. Secondly, it's psychologically radical. I'll only take a second on this. But when Jesus Christ says you must be born again, to become a Christian is to be born again, that must mean, among other things, which we're looking at, among other things, it must mean not only do you get kind of new, a new power in your life, but you actually get a new consciousness. You really feel like you're living a different life. You feel like a different person. Uh, your priorities are so changed... Uh, your, the things that define you are so changed that you really do have a shift in identity. I, we can't overdo this, but see, G, Paul himself at some place says, put on the new self. That's a strong term. And what it means, therefore, is to be born again means that you really do feel like, in some ways, you are a new person. You are living a new life because your relationship to things has changed so much. And one of my very favorite illustrations that I comfort with myself with many times uh, is very illuminating in this regard. The great philosopher Augustine, when he was, uh, uh, before he was converted, you know, was pretty much a sex addict, I guess. And after he was converted, he traveled to a town he hadn't been in in many years, and up comes a woman that he used to, you know, have a pretty sexually charged relationship with. And she comes running on up, and, and he was warm, and he was kind, and he was nice, but, but he was different. <laughs> and she didn't quite know how to take it. And as he walked away from her, he said goodbye, and he walked away, and suddenly it occurred to her, my word, maybe, maybe he just mistook me for somebody else. Maybe that's the reason. I was so nice and courteous, but no. You know, why, you know, why did he change here? So, um, and so suddenly he said, well, maybe he, missed, maybe, he, maybe he actually mistook me for somebody else. And as he walked away, she called him and said, Augustine, it is I. And he turned and says, oh, I know, but it is not I. Now, you see, yeah, you know, that's fair for a Christian to say. This is not schizophrenia. <laughs> you know, what, what it does, it, he remembers. I mean, he's not, he's not, he's not coming with amnesia. But he's so different in the things that drive him that in some ways you feel like, you know, I remember what I did, but I hardly remember why I did it. I remember what it was like to be that afraid, but I hardly can remember really what it was like to be that afraid. You really are, psycho psychologically it's radical, you're born again. Thirdly, you're or it's organically radical. Now, when I, by organically radical, I mean this. When Jesus uses the term born again, he's talking about life, a new principle of supernatural life put into you. In verse 5 through 7, if I had time, I would pull this out. But in verse 5 through 7, when he says, uh, I, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless you're born of water and the spirit. S spirit gives birth to spirit. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot come tell where it comes from. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. He is actually summarizing and quoting Ezekiel 35 and thir pardon me, 36 and 37 in the Old Testament. And in Ezekiel 36, God says, I'm going to give you a new heart by washing you with the water and the Spirit. And he likens the Spirit to water that brings a new desire for holiness. And in, in chapter 37, you have the famous dry bones uh, incident, which I can't go into, but this is the place where, where Ezekiel sees the dry bones, and in comes the wind, and God says, my spirit, you see, will give them life. And what Jesus is saying is simply this. To be born again means at a certain point, God puts his spirit in you. He implants it deep in your heart at its very root. So new desires and new motivations and new power, new life is planted and in a certain sense, you're replanted. Now, here we're mixing metaphors a little bit, but in 1 Peter 1, verse 23, Peter says, we are born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. Now, here's what Peter's saying, and here's how you can understand this. This is an organic change. This is transformation through the implantation of new life. This is not reformation by simply summonsing up and rearranging the old life. So, for example, what if you had an orchard, and it was an apple orchard, and you say, next year, I want to get peaches from it. I'm tired of apples. I want peaches. Fine. What would you do? Well, one thing you say is, well, I'm going to water and fertilize it far better than I did last year. I mean, I'm going to give it a lot more water. I'm going to give it a lot more fertilizer. I'm really going to feed those trees. But you're just going to get bigger apples. You're not going to get peaches like that. Ah, okay, well, I'll prune them. I'll cut them back. I'll do all that gardening, pruning stuff. Well, you'll just get more apples. In other words, 
This is saying that if you want new fruit, you have to have a new root. That you have to be completely replanted. You see, reformation, where you just try harder and you read the Bible and you go to church and you get into a small group and you, and you stop doing all the things that my, your mother always told you you shouldn't do anyway, but you've been doing since you came to New York and you're trying really hard. What are you doing? What are you doing? It's reformation. That's not transformation. That's pruning and that's fertilizing, and, but it's not replanting. You need a new life. You have to be organically radicalized. It means at your root. Radical means the radix, the root. At your root, something new. So, the new birth is morally radical and it's psychologically radical and it's organically radical, but now here. None of this is really going to make sense. I know a lot of you find this is all vivid, but it's not going to make sense until you realize it also has to be foundationally radical, and here's what I mean. The, uh, just like last week, actually, if you were here last week, there is a, there's, a, there's, a non, there's an apparent non sequitur in the conversation, just like last week. Remember last week, uh, the woman says, you know, I'm not spiritually thirsty, and Jesus says, go get your husband. And it looks like a non sequitur. Well, we can't go back into that. But actually, the whole passage opens up in a way when you realize that Jesus is not changing the subject. But let's, let's not go back to that. But here we have another one. Here comes, here comes Nicodemus, and he says, look, in verse 2, he says, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher. You've come from God to teach us. You've come from God to teach us, and, this, and the miracles that you perform prove that you've come from God to teach us. You are a teacher. And Jesus suddenly says, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Is that a non sequitur? Hmm? Is that a changing the subject? That's what I always thought until this week. It's not. Because here's what Jesus is saying. Nicodemus came in and said, I know that you've come to be a teacher, but the whole rest of this passage is Jesus Christ vehemently, abruptly. I mean, Jesus is he's interrupting him. He, he, he doesn't let him get a word in edgewise. His first statement is 30 words. His second statement is 20 words. His third statement is four words. And after that, he never speaks again. Jesus just, just, just rides over him. All the way to the end of the chapter, you can read the end of the chapter, we never hear from Nicodemus again. He just, thought, he just starts listening. Why? I mean, Jesus with, with the woman at the well, she, he was so careful to get her going and get her out and help her to talk. What's going on? Nicodemus says, you are essentially a teacher. And Jesus Christ in the whole rest of this passage is really saying, if you believe that, you can never be born again. See, look, first of all, he says, we know that you're from God to teach us. But look at the very end. He says, yeah, I've come from God, all right. I used to live in heaven. I'm a little bit more with God than you think, all right? And then he says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And he goes, he's taking a very obscure little, little story out of Numbers chapter 21, in which the children of Israel in the wilderness are bitten by a group of a bunch of snakes, and they're laying there dying. And it looks like they're all going to be wiped out. Dying with convulsions, high fevers, dying with their, with their systems full of poison. And God says to Moses, take a bronze serpent, make a serpent out of bronze, and put it up on a stick so that all who look at it will be healed. And that's what he does. Now, that's a very obscure and kind of weird little, little story. But Jesus Christ says, you say, I've come to teach you, I've come to save you. You think you need more teaching, you need a whole new life. If you go through and see what he says at every point, that's what Jesus is doing. And Jesus is saying, unless you break through, you are in a teacher paradigm. You think that basically I'm an example, I'm a helper, I'm a teacher. You think the true religion is basically getting the teaching and trying your best, and then God will have a favor on you. As long as you believe that, you will never be born again. You've got to break out of the teacher paradigm into a whole new way of thinking. That is, I'm your savior. Now, that's how Luther did it. In fact, look, let me just tell you, this is a very famous st statement by Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a good man. Martin Luther was a Nicodemus, if there ever was a Nicodemus. Martin Luther was an Augustinian monk. Martin Luther uh, lectured on the Bible to, to uh, seminarians, to, to priests that were in training. And he wasn't a Christian. He was religious. But what happened? This is what he says. It's a very famous account. He says, I labored diligently. Now listen to that. And anxiously as to how to understand Paul's word in Romans 1.17. He had, he had a verse. 
Just like, actually, God, just like Jesus gave Nicodemus a very, very strange passage, and he says, go and think about that until you break through. That's what he's doing to Nicodemus. He doesn't do this to the Samaritan woman. Can you imagine taking somebody? He always gives you what you need. He has a scripture scholar, and he says, I'm going to give you a passage of scripture, and you think about that until you figure it out. But you see, that's what Luther was doing. He says, I was laboring diligently and anxiously as to how to understand Paul's word in Romans 1.17. Where he says, this is Luther talking, where he says that the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. I took it to mean that righteousness, I took it to mean that righteousness whereby God punishes the unrighteous. And I had no confidence that my own heart could possibly assuage him or my merit. Then I grasped that the righteousness of God is that righteousness which through grace and sheer mercy God gives to us through Christ and faith. Thereupon, hear this, I felt myself to, thereupon I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. When I saw the difference, that law is one thing and the gospel is another, I broke through. Now, you know, why do you think Jesus so vehemently goes after Nicodemus? He's not changing the subject. Nicodemus says, I know why you came. You came to teach. And Jesus says, you don't need more teaching. If you treat me as a teacher who tells you how to save yourself, rather than a savior who comes to do everything you could never do, you'll never be born again. Until you break through, until you understand that, you can't be born again. When Luther broke through, when Nicodemus broke through, that's when you're born again. And put, put it another way, let me, let me press this, Don't, Christian friends, you need to hear this, and those of you who aren't sure whether you're Christians or not, you need to hear this too. Because why would this be considered the new birth? I'll tell you why. Because it changes the way you see everything. Verse 3 says, you must be born again to see the kingdom. Well, it doesn't mean that Nicodemus didn't know there was a kingdom. He knew there was the kingdom of God. What does it mean? It means that once you, understand, once you break out of the, the teacher paradigm into the savior paradigm, everything changes. Let me tell you, let me give you an example. I hate to do it. Every so often I do it. Some years ago, I remember somebody came up to me and said, did you remember, did you get to the thing I asked you to get to? And I said, absolutely, it'll be done by tomorrow. And as I was walking away, I realized, I mean, really, it happened so fast. I was walking away and I realized I just lied. I had totally forgotten all about the thing, and I didn't want to give that person the impression that I had forgotten. I want them to think that I'm a wonderful pastor who thinks and cares about everybody, knows everybody by name, knows everything about, and knows that your aunt's dying of, of something, knows that your, your, you know, your, your mother is unhappy in her marriage, and knows all these things. And I really wanted people to believe that, and as I walked away, I realized I had lied. Now, the only problem is I realized there was two ways to go about dealing with this or even understanding it. There's the teacher paradigm and there's the savior paradigm. One of the things I realized right away was, you know, my, my wife is um, basically as sinful as me. We're, I, we, we consider ourselves basically the same sin, sin, sinner level. But I know that she would never have ever lied into those circumstances. If somebody came up and asked her if she'd gotten to something, she said, well, I know this is going to make you unhappy, but no, I forgot totally about it. No problem. So what, what's my problem? Is, am I more sinful than she is? Not, not, not in general, but here's what's going on. If I think of Jesus as a teacher, I have to grab myself and I have to say, oh, I failed him as a teacher. The teacher said, no, do not lie. The teacher said, let your less be yes and your no be no, swear not at all. The teacher said, this around, I failed him. And so what am I going to do? If I go after it like a teacher, if I, if I operate out of the teacher paradigm, out of fear, I will bend myself mechanically toward honesty. The other thing I can do is I can use the gospel on myself. The other thing I can do is come at it in a savior paradigm. The other thing I can do is I can say, wait a minute. I didn't just sin on the surface when I lied. I lied because underneath the surface, I was treating something else as my Lord and Savior besides Jesus. I was failing to rejoice in Jesus' love for me. I was making the approval of other people. The real thing that turned my crank, the real thing I relied on for hope and meaning. Jesus Christ came into the world, and he died because he thought I was that great. How can I esteem his love of less value, emotionally, psychologically, you see, than I do what other people think? And here's what's very interesting. If I operate out of a teaching mode, I can bend myself toward honesty. But if I operate out of the Savior paradigm, I repent not just for the surface, but I repent for the sin beneath the sin. That is making something besides Jesus my Savior. 
hoping in something else, and I rejoice in his saviorness, and it melts my heart into honesty. You know what that means. You see, that's the reason Jesus is so vehement. Because once you begin to look at everything through Jesus as Savior, once you realize that all your problems, all of your worries, all of your difficulties, all of your temptations are always because not just that you violate Jesus as teacher, which of course you do, but basically you're failing to believe in him as Savior at that moment. At the macro level, if you don't understand this at all, you're not a Christian. You're not born again. But even after you understand it at the big level and you receive it like Luther did, and you, spend, you have to spend all the rest of your life living out your new birth. You see, I was failing to live out my new birth at that point because, you see, here's where the metaphor breaks down a little bit. Paul says, yeah, through the new birth, you've got a new self, but you see what? You still have an old self. You've got a new you and an old you, and you can operate either out of the teacher paradigm or the savior paradigm, which is it going to be. But do you see, to be born again means you see everything differently. It's morally radical, it's psychologically radical, it's organically radical, you see. It's visionally radical. It changes everything. Everything is new. Okay? Okay, how do we receive it? Just keep this in mind. Just this in mind. There's a lot that we're told here about Nicodemus later on. Here's all you have to know. First of all, number one, Nicodemus did start to listen. Notice this? He starts listening more and more and more, and one of the most interesting things is we hear about Nicodemus two other times in the book of John. In chapter 7, verse 51, in chapter 7, verse 51, there's a very, very interesting statement where Nicodemus gets up and tries to say something to the Sanhedrin, and they're talking about Jesus, and he gets up and he says, does our law condemn anyone without first hearing him to find out what he is doing? And they just, they just, they laugh at him and they make him sit down. But you know what? That means he is still listening to Jesus. I mean, the, the point of this is for some of us, those of us, especially us Nicodemuses, us nice people, you know, some of the nasty people, the difficult people, the people out of control, the broken people, Jesus is so nice with, and he brings them along and all that. But it's with the nice people, the together, the pull together people that he basically says, sit down and shut up and think about this. And he gives them something to think about that will get them out of the teacher paradigm into the savior paradigm. In this case, he gives them one thing. He says, I want you to think about that. What does it mean that I will be lifted up? What does it mean to be lifted up so that all the venom and all the poison in your system will be healed? I came to be lifted up. I didn't come to be a teacher. I came to be lifted up. And he's thinking and he's thinking and he's thinking. And finally... You see, that's the first thing. The first thing you've got to do is think. Listen to him and think about the paradigm. Don't just say, well, how do I get this experience? How do I get this experience? How do I, how do I get these feelings? I just need this peace you're talking about. I need this power you're talking about. Don't do it. If you look carefully, you'll see that this metaphor keeps you away from that. You can't... <laughs> listen. Who actually brings about a birth? The baby? You know? Has anybody gone and gotten born? You don't go and get born. Okay? Birth happens to you, but the baby doesn't do a doggone thing. It's all the mother. Hmm? The baby is brought into this world through the mother's labor. The baby is brought into the world through the mother's pain. See, someone else. The baby is born through the mother bearing the weight through all those months. Somebody else suffers. Somebody else is burdened. Somebody else is in labor. Somebody else is in anguish. Somebody else is bleeding. I've seen three births. Don't you see how different this is? You can't make yourself a Christian. You can't have this experience. You can't force yourself into this. You can't say, I want these great feelings. I'm going to pray till I feel good. I want this power. Lord, just come into my life and just give me this power. Don't do it. It doesn't mean he won't use stupid questions. I mean, he's often answered stupid questions, but it's a stupid question. Because, you see, the new birth. You are not the one who does anything. It's him. So you have to... It's someone else. Christianity's different. And that's the reason why Jesus is trying to say, you want me to be a teacher. You want to do this. You have to receive it. You want to have an experience. You simply have to look to me. The experience comes from believing in me. He doesn't say, go get born. He doesn't say, have this experience. He says, believe in me, lift it up. 
So first of all, you have to listen and think until you understand the paradigm difference. And secondly, the best way to do it is to do what Nicodemus did. Here's all we know about Nicodemus, how he ended his life. In chapter 19, verse 31, we read this. Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. And now, Je now Jer Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for he feared... But with... I don't have it all written down here. But with Pilate's permission, Joseph took the body away, and he was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus by night. Taking Jesus' body, the two wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen in accord with Jew Jewish burial customs. And at the place where Jesus was crucified, a garden was there, a new tomb, and they laid Jesus there. Listen, that was woman's work back then. He, these two old rich men went and did something that only women did. They wrapped a dead body. They took a cadaver down. They handled it. Ah, yeah, that was something women did. We know that. That's how, that's how it was in those ancient cultures. Something had changed Nicodemus' heart. That this old man was willing to come and touch the body. Why? Because Jesus had said, you think about me, you think about me, I will be lifted up. And when he actually saw him lifted up, his heart was penetrated. You see? Why? He probably understood something. And that is, whose labor, whose anguish brings us into the world? Jesus is the mother. In fact, you know, Jesus actually says that in John chapter 16. There's a remarkable place where he says this. He says, in a little while you will see me no more. This is John 16, 19. He's saying this to the disciples. In a little while you'll see me no more. He's talking to his death. But then this is what he says. He says, a woman giving birth to a child has pain because her hour has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. Now, you know, every place where Jesus talks about in the Gospel of John, his hour, he's talking about his death. And Jesus Christ, therefore, is saying, I'm the woman. I'm the mother. I will die in this labor. I will die in my blood. When I am lifted up on the cross, I will lose the Father's love so you can have it. But I love you so much that even as I die, when I see you born... It'll be all worth it. Nicodemus got it. He thought about it, and he thought about it, and he thought about it. Don't you dare try to push your experience through some scheme of somebody else's. Don't look at John 4, right? John 4, the Samaritan woman. See how immediately she runs into her, into the, out into the town, tells people about Jesus. She's transformed. Look how long it took Nicodemus. Thinking, meditating on Numbers 21 until it dawns on him. <clears throat> Everybody's different. Jesus treats everybody as different. Don't think that you've got to be like her. Don't you think you have to be like him? Think of who he is. Look at the one through whose labor you were brought into the world, who is filled with delight when he sees you born, even though he's dying at the moment. Think about that. And Christian friends, <clears throat> Don't just say, I'm born again. Live born again. Let's pray. Our Father, we ask that you would help us to see why this is such a radical message, <clears throat> why it gives hope to everybody, yet what a challenging message it is. Would you please help us to appropriate it for ourselves? Everybody in this room is at a different place. So by your Holy Spirit, open our eyes to seeing you lift it up. Now grant all this. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. For more of this series and other resources from Timothy Keller and Redeemer Presbyterian Church, please visit www.gospelinlife.com.